All right, thanks, Gershon. All right, well, so we know that on Wednesday uh, we had this, these baptisms on Australia Day, so I thought I'd take the opportunity just after we had those baptisms to do a bit of a crash course in baptism and uh, just give you guys a lot of information. <coughs> there's, there's a lot of verses I'm going through today. I'm going to try and go through them as quickly as I can and teach you uh, a lot about baptism. So I think for some of you this might be new information, others it might be a reminder, but I think it's good for us to have, um, you know, to, to know this topic quite well. And some of the, it's a, it's a big topic, you know, it's, uh, you, it's bigger than you think it is. Um, but I'll try, I, I'll try and cover as much as I can. Um, and if you have any other questions, you can ask me about it later. So I've got six areas I want to talk about today when it comes to water baptism. I mean, first of all, let's talk about what is baptism? And I know you know, okay, well, obviously we know what baptism is. People go under the water, they come out of the water, and, um, you know, it's an ordinance that we have. But more specifically, you know, water baptism is the physical ordinance of a spiritual reality, right? It's kind of like communion. You know? Communion, there's a physical ordinance, but it's representing a spiritual reality. With communion, what is it? It's with the fact that when we believe on Jesus Christ, we have partaken of the body and blood of the Lord. So that physical ordinance is meant to sim is symbolize that. It's reminding us that yeah, we have spiritually partaken of his body and of his blood, and now we are physically doing that to remember that spiritual reality. Well, baptism is the same. Baptism is a physical ordinance. It's something that we do physically as an outward testimony of a spiritual reality. What is that spiritual reality? It's the fact that when we put our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're actually baptized by the Holy Ghost, right, into the body of Christ. Um, let's see this, uh, this connection here with the water baptism uh, and the spiritual baptism. And as the people were in expectation and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. So we know where did baptism originate? Well, John was sent to baptize, right? That's where the, baptism, the ordinance of baptism originates uh, in the New Testament books. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He's not even worthy to take Jesus' shoes off, untie his laces. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and with fire right so he's, he's alluding that jesus christ has his baptism and the water baptism is representative of that john is not the savior you know, the messiah coming there's one coming up he's pointing to jesus he's the real savior who will baptize people into the body of jesus of, of himself right so what's this with fire some people think oh how does J jesus baptize us with fire i think this is actually talking about the, the punishment right because see in verse 17 whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather his wheat into his garner but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable right so when he's talking about you he's just talking about a, a group of people the some that are saved and some that aren't because the people that are saved they're going to get baptized with the holy ghost right sealed into the body of christ saved eternally but the people that aren't they're going to get baptized with fire unquenchable Right, so that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the two different um, sort of uh, destinies that await those who either they believe on Jesus Christ or they reject Jesus Christ. Right, so there's the connect connection between the physical ordinance and then the spiritual reality, right, which is what happens to every believer when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a few things that happen to us, right? We get the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, we're baptized. Um, by the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ. And then, you know, when, when the baptism of the Holy Ghost first started, you know, in the early church, you know, it was, it was some supernatural things that went on at the same time, you know, but that doesn't happen anymore like we talked about in the last couple of weeks. So Romans 6. Let's look at Romans 6 where we see some of the things that happen when we are baptized by the Holy Ghost. So even though we read Romans 6 and you see baptized, I don't believe this baptism that is being talked about here is the water baptism, right, which is representative of what's going on here. I believe Romans 6 is actually talking about the spiritual baptism that happens, you know, when we put our faith on Jesus Christ. So it says here, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So you see how the, the physical baptism of water represents that death, burial, and resurrection. But the actual baptism of the Spirit that happens spiritually, that's what actually makes us, you know, associate with Jesus Christ's actual death, right? His death 
and, and is, is rising again. Um, and, and Romans 6 obviously goes into more depth about this spiritual um, sort of dying to ourself, right? Dying of the flesh so that we can raise to be walking uh, in newness of life. But it's not just that, you know, I'm deciding to follow Jesus, which is what I talked about at the baptism when we, you know, a baptizer is a reminder, hey, that we should live different. But remember the, the spiritual reality is we are baptized by the Holy Ghost because one day we will be buried in the likeness of his death in flesh and one day we will be raised with a new body. So you see how there's these spiritual realities that are we, we are being reminded of when we see that physical ordinance of water baptism. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of God the Father. So when it says like as Christ, Generally, this verse is taught, and you know, if you, if, you, if you just read over it and glaze over it, you might say that, oh, this is actually teaching that the water baptism is just like a like figure of you know, the death, burial, and resurrection. But that's not what is actually being said here. It's saying, we are buried with him by baptism into death, right? Like the baptism of the Spirit, where it dissociate, makes us die with Jesus Christ. That like, in the likeness, right, that Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we will one day be raised in his likeness, right? When we, you know, when the last trump at the rapture, we all get our new bodies, that's going to be in the likeness that Christ was raised up from the dead. In his, in the, in the, uh, by the glory of God the Father, right? So, you know, when he died in the flesh, took on our sins, he was raised with a glorious new body. When we are resurrected, we will have that same likeness. So that's what that's saying, that like as Christ was raised. So that, the fact that we are going to be raised up in this new likeness, it's saying, hey, that should remind us, like, while we're on, while we're on this earth, we should walk in newness of life. We should walk as we are going to be. Right? That's what that's saying, verse 4. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, so this is not the water baptism, you know, where it's just it's representing something. It's saying we are actually going to die in the likeness of his death. Remember, he took on flesh, he took on our sins, he died physically. He's saying we will die physically in this sinful body, right? In that same likeness. We shall also be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So you see how, what do we get when we are baptized by the Holy Ghost? When we believe on Jesus Christ, we, we receive that spiritual baptism like everybody does, right? One is, we are now baptized into Jesus Christ. We become part of the body of Christ. It's one thing that happens. Another thing is, that's what being baptized into the body of Christ, that's what gives us this, this, uh, this I guess, this, uh, this privilege, I don't know what you call it, of we are going to die with him and one day we are going to be raised with him in the glory that he was raised with. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So when we actually get that new body, we will be sinless. But what it's saying here, because we die with Christ, and because one day we're going to be sinless, while you live on this earth with the sinful flesh, you ought to live like you're going to be. That's sort of what Romans 6 is going, going to. Look at 1 John 3, <coughs> verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. So he's saying, hey, look, this is a great privilege that we get, that even though our um, full salvation, right, is not complete, what I mean by that is that we, our bodies are still to, to be resurrected. Right? So when we talk about our full salvation, it's both body and spirit, like the whole thing. But we've received the first fruits of salvation, right? where our spirit is born again. Now we're sealed. So we will, we'll, we'll definitely one day get that other bodily salvation. Right? But he's saying here, hey, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. So even though we're still in this sinful flesh right now, God still treats us. As sons of God, right? We can still be called sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. 
but we know. So it's saying, hey, we don't know yet what our body's going to be like when we will rise again. But we know that when he shall appear, this is when Jesus comes up, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Right? So that's that picture of uh, you know, what's happening spiritually and what's to come in the future. But you know, there is also, like we talk about at baptism, you know, there's the, it's the symbolic you know, death, burial, and resurrection, and it's a reminder to walk in newness of life. So, like I said, just like communion is a physical ordinance of a spiritual reality, water baptism is a physical ordinance of a spiritual reality. We have two ordinances. Um, it's a bit like a wedding ring, right? Like a wedding ring, we will say it's like a physical tradition, isn't it? It's like a visual tradition. We wouldn't really call it an ordinance, because ordinance, we'd say, hey, that's something that Jesus has kind of given us to continue. But, you know, wedding rings are just man's traditions, right? So it's like a wedding ring. It's a physical tradition, but it's of a spiritual reality, isn't it? The covenant that husband and wife make, and this represents that. So the baptism is the same. So because of that, it's a public testimony, isn't it? It's a public testimony that is symbolic of the baptism, which with the Holy Ghost by Jesus Christ. So remember, it's the same with communion, isn't it? Yeah, you know, he says, you, as often as you do this, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. So you see how like when a church has communion, they break bread. It's, it's sort of like an outward testimony of like, hey, why do we do this? Well, it's to remember that we are partakers of the broken body and shed blood. It's the same with baptism, okay? So baptism is a <coughs> physical ordinance of a spiritual reality. Number two. So because it's a public testimony of something that happens to you when you believe on Jesus Christ, that's why it makes sense that baptism is only for believers. Right? Baptism, so think about it. Why wear a wedding ring if you're not married? Right? It's the same with communion. Like why partake in communion if you haven't even partaken of the spiritual body and blood of Jesus Christ? You haven't put your faith on Jesus Christ and taken part in that. So that's why it makes no sense for an unbeliever to partake in communion. Because we know communion doesn't save us, right? We're not saved by works. It's something representative of something that has happened to you spiritually. And it's the same with baptism. Why be baptized with water when you haven't been baptized with the Holy Ghost? Why you haven't believed on Jesus Christ and been baptized into the body? <coughs> so what hinders us from being baptized. Well, we see here in Acts 8, this is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And we get some insight into, hey, somebody here wanted to get baptized and he asks the question, well, what's stopping him from being baptized? But Acts 8, verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water and the eunuch said, see here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? So if you don't know the story in Acts 8, you can go and read it another time. But basically, the Ethiopian eunuch, he's riding in a chariot, right? And he's reading the book of Isaiah, right? And the spirit sort of tells Philip, we'll go talk to this guy in the chariot. So he goes in, he realizes he's reading um, Isaiah 53. And he says, hey, do you want to understand what you read? And the Ethiopian eunuch says, well, how can I except some man guide me? So Philip gets into the, the chariot and he preaches him from there because the Ethiopian eunuchs Thinking about Isaiah 53, it's talking about the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. And then the Ethiopian eunuch says, is this talking about the guy that's writing it, or is this talking about some other person? So Philip, from Isaiah 53, preaches unto him Jesus. And he comes to, you know, later on, he says, hey, he believes that. And then they're, they're going on their way. They came unto a certain body of water. And the Ethiopian eunuch says, hey, here's water. So obviously Philip is talking to him about a lot of other things, not just salvation, right? So he's got him saved, he's talked to him about Jesus, but he's also talking to him about baptism. The eunuch says, hey, here's a body of water, what's stopping me from getting baptized? Verse 37, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So you see how Philip knew, hey, you believe first, you get saved first, then you go and get baptized. Right? This is why we don't baptize unbelievers. This is why we don't baptize unbelieving children that don't understand yet, they haven't put their faith on Jesus Christ. Right? So we do that. So um, why don't we do that? Well, this is the reason. Because what stops a person from getting baptized? Well, they have to believe on Jesus Christ with all their heart. This is why 
when, when I baptize people, that's why I say those words. I say, hey, have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart? And they say, yes, that's, then there's nothing stopping them from getting baptized. Right? So only faith, belief, stops you from getting baptized. And once you have faith on Jesus Christ, you can get baptized immediately. So we see here that, uh, you know, in the Ethiopian eunuch, it's not that the Ethiopian eunuch had to jump through a whole bunch of hoops and they had to watch first to see if he was living right and all these other reasons. Like, they, people stop people from getting bap, uh, baptized. Because churches have all sorts of reasons for why they delay baptism. And, you know, we don't delay baptism. The only thing delaying baptism here is just Victor getting his act together and just organizing one, right? So it's my fault here. But in terms of, on your end, there's nothing stopping you. Once you believe on Jesus Christ, hey, you should be able to get baptized. But some churches delay baptism for other reasons. For some reasons. They might say, hey, it's your knowledge of the faith. You know, before they baptize you, you need to, like, you know, sit their you know, fundamentals course or whatever and learn all these things, make sure you agree to them. I mean, is that what Philip did to the Ethiopian eunuch? He said, what's stopping me from getting baptized? It's just if you believe with all your heart. It's not like, hey, wait a second, I need to take you through some of the Gospels, you need to learn some fundamentals, you need to make sure you understand all these things. No, just, just baptize him if you believe. So some churches do that, and I don't think they should. You know, I think people should just get baptized. It's the first step. It's not you have to prove your, your worthiness of baptism. It doesn't even make sense, because baptism is to represent you receiving something you're not worthy of, and then yet you have to work in order to earn that 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 uh, physical ordinance, which is meant to represent something that's given to you by grace, right? So another thing, reason why they delay baptism might be your commitment to church. They say, well, we don't baptize people, and then maybe they don't come back to church. But your church attendance shouldn't earn you baptism, right? If people believe, they should get baptized. Not, it has no relevance to how much they come to church, how committed they are. Some churches, they'll be like, oh, well, let's wait and see if they're, you know, consistent with their church attendance. And again, it's just like, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's destroying that picture of, of a baptism, which is it's by grace. It's just if you believe, you, you get baptized. Um, another one, it might be, you know, your willingness to live right. Oh, you might be coming to church, but maybe, they, you know, you've still got some of those sins in your life. Make sure you turn from those before you can get baptized. Prove your worthiness by works. Another one is, you know, sometimes they just set an arbitrary age and they just say, okay, children under 12 just can't get baptized. Yeah, but if children are saved, if they can understand salvation like Jesus says, and you come to him as a little child, have faith as a little child, I mean, if children understand salvation, they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we shouldn't just set some arbitrary age, oh, you have to be 15, you have to be 12, if they understand it, eh? some, some children develop differently, right, some children understand at 8, some children understand at 10, they should just get baptized when they understand salvation, and they're saved. And you say, Victor, you just make it too easy to get baptized. Well, that's, that's salvation. And you say, like, well, Victor, aren't you worried about baptizing somebody that's not really saved? You know, I'm more worried about not baptizing somebody that is saved, right, than, not bapti than baptizing somebody that's not saved. Because you know what? If you baptize somebody that's not saved, and they, maybe they, later on they under, you just baptize them again. But then why should we stop people who are saved from getting baptized. You know, stop, you're stopping them from uh, taking that step of obedience. So it's more important, I think, that we make sure people that are saved can get baptized than it is to go, oh, you know, maybe we'll baptize somebody that's not saved. You know, it's not the end of the world if you baptize somebody that's not saved, you know? But, you know, they're confessing the right thing because sometimes people, they know how to repeat the right thing, but maybe they don't have full understanding. But you can only judge by the things they say. Then maybe later on they say, you know, I have a better understanding. Maybe they want to get baptized again. Then they can get baptized again. It's not that big a deal because now they're actually getting baptized. Now they actually understand, they're actually saved. It's not that big a deal if, you know, we, we can't judge perfectly, right? But I think it is a big deal if somebody is saved and they want to take that step of obedience and then we put this barrier in front of them that's just man-made for, for, no, for no good reason, right? Here's an example here in Acts 19 where we have people that got baptized, well, they got, you know, they, 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 they got baptized by John the Baptist, but they weren't actually saved. Acts 19, it came to pass that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So these are people that are following Jesus, trying to do the right thing, right? 
He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So he's saying, you know, because back then, remember they were laying hands on people and people were getting gifts from the Holy Ghost. So, you know, here talking to Paul, they say, hey, have you, you, got, you guys been, you know, had your ha like people lay your hands on you, uh, apostles lay hands on you and get some gifts. He said, they said unto him, look at this, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He's saying, we don't even know what the Holy Ghost is. It's like, well, how can you be saved if you don't even know what the Holy Ghost is? I mean, this is what John the Baptist is preaching. I'm baptizing you with water. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. All right? So Paul realizes that they're not saved. He says, he says unto them, under what then were you baptized? It's like, well, they knew, who baptized you? He says, and unto John's baptism. So they were actually baptized by John the Baptist, but they weren't actually saved. So we're worried about baptizing unsaved people. Hey, John, even John the Baptist baptized them unsaved people. But you know, but it's just based on their profession. But they, they didn't have a full understanding. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Look at this. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So here's an example where somebody was dunked in water. They weren't saved. They didn't have the right understanding. Their understanding was then tweaked. They now understand that they have to believe on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one that's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost. Look at this. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So you see, if you were, quote unquote, baptized, you know, quote unquote, because you're not really baptized, before you were saved, you still are not baptized. You need to be baptized. You see, we've, we've all had a bath. We've all gone for a swim. That doesn't mean you're baptized. You know, just because you, you put some water on a baby or you dunk them in some water, that doesn't mean they're baptized. That just means you did some religious ritual with some organization that's doing a practice that has nothing to do with the Bible. Now that you believe on Jesus Christ, right now it's time to actually do what God commanded, which is I get baptized. Right? Because you, baptize, you get baptized once you believe. Right? So unbelievers should not be baptized to just join a membership list. You know, sometimes believers are already baptized, right? They say they got baptized somewhere else, but a church might just baptize them again because they'll have a tradition where, you know, well, that's our sort of entrance into, that's like your membership entrance. So you like, want to be part of the church, even though you're already baptized, you're saved, you're baptized, we're going to baptize you again because that's just our practice of adding you to our church. So I, I don't think these practices should be done. They're not biblical. They're just like sort of man-made things. Right? And we already talked about babies should not be baptized, right? Because they're, they're ignorant, right? They don't, they don't believe yet. It's because, well, in, what does it mean to be baptized? <coughs> if thou believe, it's with all thine heart. Now, I want to just touch on quickly why do, why, how do people justify um, baptizing babies? Right? Because, you know, beside it just being a tradition that's just been passed on. This is the verse that is used in Colossians 2. So if you say, like, hey, what verse do they use to try and justify baptizing babies? It's Colossians 2. It says here, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Now, I don't know if you caught that there, but how they will try and use this verse to support that doctrine is they'll say, you see what this verse is teaching? It is teaching that baptism is actually the New Testament circumcision. Right? So you see the link there? So you see how we're cir cir flesh circumcised, uh, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, and we're buried in the baptism. So you see how baptism is actually the New Testament circumcision. And just like they circumcised children in the Old Testament to be joined God's people, you baptize to join God's people and we baptize children. Right? But then that, this is where it comes from. But is that really what this is saying? I mean, is this, is this saying that baptism is circumcision? It's just talking about two different things. It's just saying, yeah, when we believe on Jesus Christ, Right? We're complete in him. So that's why we don't need to get circumcised because the true spiritual circumcision happens when we put our faith on Jesus Christ. 
And it's the same with baptism. Baptism is, you know, we're put into the body of Christ. We're going to be risen with him. So these are just talking about things that happen to us when we believe on Jesus Christ and how we're complete in him. This is not saying one is the other. Right? But that's how they would understand this verse. This is how the reasoning, when they teach, you know, why do they practice baptism like circumcision? But the thing is, but they're not 100% the same. Because, I mean, one, one is, you know, with circumcision... Only males are circumcised. Right? You don't circumcise females. Right? But then they'll baptise children, girls and, and boys. Um, circumcision added you to God's people. You, know, you had to be circumcised in order to, to join the nation of, of Israel. But baptism doesn't add you to, to God's people. right? Like the water baptism doesn't. What, what adds you to God's people is actually the spiritual baptism, right? The water baptism is just representative of that. Just like, just like communion doesn't save you, communion is just representative of what actually saves you, which is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So that's where they kind of get the base. That's, that's the verse they have, right? Now they go to other verses where they try and say, like, well, here are examples of people getting baptized and then baptizing their children as well. But let's have a look at them and see, is that, is that actually what happens? So this is Acts 16. This is Lydia, right? So Lydia is a lady they met, um, and her household gets baptized. Right? It says here, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, so Lydia believes, and when she was baptized, and her household... She besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. She constrained us. So the way they use this verse, and they'll say, See, Lydia bapti was baptized, and then all her house were baptized, even though they were unbelievers. Right? So that's how they sort of use these passages. Right? Now, is that the right interpretation? Are we meant to interpret it that way when we have Acts 8, where the Ethiopian eunuch saying, What doth the enemy be baptized? He said, You've got to believe. So we're meant to think that in Acts 16, the apostles and the disciples are just then baptizing a whole bunch of unbelievers, you know, just because one person in the house gets baptized? No, so we don't know, first of all, how old these people are in the household. Because in a household, you have adult children, you have other adults in there, you might have servants, other things. So, and then and we don't even, we're not even told here whether or not they believe or not. Right? It doesn't actually say it in the passage. But what would the safe assumption be if people are getting baptized, if the household's getting baptized? It's, it's that they actually believe, because that's, we know, know from other passages that that's what's stopping people from getting baptized. So you see, it's, it's not 100% clear here that Lydia is an example of baptizing her infant children. This is just saying that Lydia and her household got baptized. We're not really told much else. But you know, when we read further down and we look at the Philippian jailer, right, we are told some more information. So this is the uh, passage in Acts 16 where we get this great verse that we use, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And the context of this passage is they're in jail, right? The jail's cell's open. The jailer is actually worried about losing his life. He comes down and says to them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So the jailer is actually asking Paul and Silas who were in the prison, what must I do to be saved? And they respond, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So they go on. They, they preached a bit more unto him. They spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. So you see how they're preaching to him. They're also explaining things to people in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. <coughs> <coughs> so did Paul baptize people that he didn't explain things to? No, because he preached the gospel to them and to all that were in his house. He washed, they got their stripes washed, the jailer was baptized, he and all his straightway, and all his house. Right? But are these unbelievers here? No, because look, as we read on, and when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them. So he's feeding Paul and Silas. Look, and rejoice, look at this, believing in God, with all his house. So you see how they all, they believed. That's why they got baptized. That's why his house got baptized, because then they believed. So there are some examples. They're basically the verses that people use to try and justify uh, infant baptism. And I just don't think 
they hold, they hold up at all. Um, now what about, just the last thing in this point, what about baby dedications? Baby de you know what baby dedications are? Mm -hmm. Baby dedications, I feel, they're like Baptists trying to like, um, what's the word, like uh, allude to, what's the word where they, they try, cater, they're trying to cater to these Catholic practices. Right? So you have these Catholic practices of baptizing babies that gets passed on and Protestants do it as well and Orthodox do it as well. And then these Catholics and all the, they all join Baptist churches, right? And then Baptists want to kind of like just keep that tradition going, but they know that infant baptism is wrong, so they just turn it into a baby dedication. So I'm just like not, I just don't like these ordinances that, because we're already given two ordinances, right? We're, giving, we're given ordinance of baptism and we're given communion. I think that that's just enough. That's enough traditions for the church to practice because those are the ones that are given. I don't think we need to add these ones that just cater to practices that are unbiblical, right, and then do these things. Now, that's why I don't do them in our church. If a church wants to do them, you know, I'm not saying it's a sin for them to do it. Um, I, just, I just don't do it for those reasons. <laughs> All right, so that's baby dedications. All right, let's go on to number three. Number three, we talked about that baptism is also symbolic of the resurrection, right? So there is a symbolism there that when you're in the water, that's like Jesus on the cross. You're under the water, that's Jesus dying, his body buried. But I also believe there's some symbolism that Jesus' soul descended into hell to pay for our sins. And I just think it's interesting that we're baptized with water. Not only does this, the water represent you know, the spirit, but I, I feel like water also represents God's wrath as well. So it's just... You know, it's like water represents the spirit, also represents God's wrath, like in Noah's day. And it's just interesting that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And it, I just, it all just, just links up so beautifully, like, you know, how God does things. So I think that's, that's really cool. So Jesus dying, being buried, but also the fact that his soul descended into God's wrath, right? <coughs> and then coming out of the water is being risen again. And we read that in Romans 6 where it's like we are buried with him by baptism into death. Now, like I said, I think this baptism here is specifically referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but there's still that, that symbolism, right? That's it. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. And that's why I think that the baptism with water should remind us, hey, you know, we take this step of obedience, we ought to live differently. You know, we shouldn't be the same as we were before. Colossians 2, we're buried with him. We, we looked at this passage. In baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So because we are buried by baptism, right? This is why baptism should not be practiced by sprinkling. I mean by sprinkling where they either just flick some water on somebody or they just take a handful of water, or they take a cup and they, they pour it, or they're just pouring some water on people. See, when you bury somebody, you don't just put a cup of dirt over them, do you? I mean, you completely submerse them in earth. So when we're burying somebody, this is why they go under by immersion and they come up again. Well, this is why baptism is by immersion. Now, let's look at some verses where... <coughs> <laughs> oh, before I <laughs> look at these verses, how do proponents, I don't have any verses for this, but just to, to give you some thoughts on how do people try and justify baptism by sprinkling. So how do, how do proponents of baptism by sprinkling or by pouring support their doctrine, right? Well, what they do is they go back to the Old Testament where there was the sprinkling of blood, right? And they believe it's like a purification, which is like what, it, what the sprinkling of blood did represent in the Old Testament. The sprinkling of blood to purify in the Old Testament, I mean, that was a picture of Jesus Christ's blood, right? Sprinkling us clean. You know, that's the symbolism there. There's not the symbolism of water purifying today. But why do they believe that? Because, see, a lot of religions believe that baptism is what saves you. Is that what washes away your sin? I remember, baptism is not representative of a cleaning Baptism is representative of a death, burial, and resurrection. And because they have this idea that baptism is like a cleaning, they think, you know, well, there's the sprinkling in the Old Testament to cleanse of sins, so baptism can be by sprinkling today to, to, to cleanse. So that's how they kind of 
have a rationale for what they do, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's right and, and biblical. Um, sometimes I've heard justification for sprinkling that they'll just look to like traditions of what's practiced by church fathers, because not all old Christians believe the same. Right? There's a lot of old Christians that believed practices like infant baptism and like baptism by sprinkling. So, of course, you can find, you know, people writing about it. You can find church fathers and maybe paintings of people um, getting baptized by <laughs> sprinkling <coughs> or by pouring. But, you know, we don't base our doctrine and our practices on traditions, on paintings, on what old people did. We should base what we do as much as we can on what the Bible teaches. And, you know, I'm told sometimes there are paintings where people are standing in a body of water. I mean, this is how maybe they think the Ophian eunuch was baptized. Standing in a body of water, and then the person just gets a cup of water or a handful of water and puts it on their head. And you just think, like, well, what's the point of standing in water if you're just going to put it on somebody's head, right? You might as well just stand somewhere else if you're just going to put water on their head. But no, people are baptized by immersion and I think we have some good evidence in the Bible of being baptized by immersion I mean John 3 verse 23 it says here and John also was baptizing in Anon near, near to Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized now unless you're baptizing by immersion what do you need a lot of water for I mean if you're baptizing by sprinkling I mean you don't even need a body of water you just need to get it from the aqueduct or whatever they, they get it from and then just baptize people but no, the reason why you need a lot of water there is because people are getting baptized and they're going into the water and getting baptized. So same with Acts 8. It says he commanded the chariot, this is uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, back to that story. He commanded the chariot to stand still and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So if it baptizes by sprinkling, why are they both going down in the water? Why, why so inconvenient? Why just Philip just go down get a handful of water, you know, bring it back to the chariot and then just throw it on him. But no, they, why do they both go down into the water? Because well, he's going to bury him in baptism, right? That picture there. Matthew 3, Jesus, when he was baptized, look at this, went up straightway out of the water and lo, the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now the funny thing about this one is that most Christians that practice sprinkling they, they will accept that this verse is Jesus being immersed, right? So they, stay, they, go, they will say, Jesus, they, they acknowledge that Jesus Christ, when he was baptized, was immersed in water. But they say, look, but other church fathers were baptized different ways. And they'll, they'll say things like this. They'll say things like, um, water, more or less, gospel is the best. That's, that was a saying that I used to hear in the church that I first went to. And basically what they're saying is, even though they acknowledge that Jesus Christ is baptized by immersion, other people are baptized a different way and the method's not really important. You know, you're just getting baptized is what's important, not the method. But you know, it's like if you're saying, oh, you know, this reformer was baptized by sprinkling, this reformer was baptized by immersion, and then you say, but Jesus Christ was baptized by immersion, I mean, my thought is, okay, just stop there. You've said enough. You know, if Jesus Christ is baptized by immersion, that's the way I'm going to do it. I don't care, like, how other people do it. You know, I mean, if, if we have in the Bible an example of Jesus doing something one way, I mean, that's a good indication that we should be doing it that way. Yeah. So if they recognize that Jesus was baptized by immersion, then the argument's over. That's how it should be done, if Jesus is doing it that way. Sometimes they'll say things... Thing, things like this. They'll say, more water, less faith. Less water, more faith. And I just think that is absolutely the silliest thing to say, but I've seen churches say that, to try and boast, you know, saying, oh, we use less water because we have more faith, you know, and you need more water because you've got less faith. You know, it's, it's more water, more faith, because what? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, right? And we see in the Bible, there's much water there. Jesus came up straight away out of the water and went dirt down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Hey, more water means more faith, right? Because it's by immersion. All right, number four. Baptism is a command. Baptism is a command. Baptism isn't just, oh, you know, it's, 
yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an optional thing. Yeah, I feel like getting baptized. Something I want. Yes, baptism is not for me. Baptism is not optional in the Christian life. Right? Baptism is a command. If, if you are a believer on Jesus Christ, it's a command just as much as reading your Bible, making sure you're soul winning, prayer, coming to church. These are commands of God. Baptism is the same. It's a command of God. If somebody has, is saved and is not baptized, they're sinning, right? Because they're not obeying this command of God. So whilst I don't necessarily pressure people into making that decision because they, hey, they have to uh, make that decision of their own accord, right? You have to decide to obey Jesus Christ. But I tell people, no, it's something that you should do. You know, it is a command. You know, just because I don't force people to get baptized doesn't mean it's not a command. I don't force people to get baptized because I want people to make their own decision to obey God. Right? So, but it is a command. Let's have a look at some verses here. Matthew 3. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. So you can see here the humility of John, where Jesus comes to John to get baptized with water. And John says, wait a second, I'm baptizing people with water, pointing them to you, because you're going to baptize them with the Holy Ghost. Jesus answering, look at this, said unto him, suffer it, or allow it, to be so now. <coughs> For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So you see, why did Jesus have to get baptized? He didn't have any sin. He didn't need to wash away sin. Right? He's getting baptized because baptism is a command of God and he's saying, if I don't get baptized, then I'm not fulfilling all righteousness. Right? Because he had to keep the law. He had to be sinless. Part of being sinless was getting baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Okay, so it's a, no, it's, a, it's a command. It's not optional. Acts 2 verse 37. Now when they heard this, this is uh, Peter now preaching on the day of Pentecost. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost, the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right, so that's them, him commanding them to change, right, and be baptized. But earlier on in the chapter, he talks about whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we'll come back to this verse a bit later because that's, that's a verse often used that people believe you have to be baptized to be saved. But we'll come back to that one. Acts 10, here's, so that was to the Jews, Peter was commanding, now it's to the Gentiles here. While Peter yet spake these words, he's preaching the gospel to these Gentiles here, and then they get saved. The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So even Peter realized, hey, people are saved. Hey, can any man forbid water? Can any man stop these people from getting saved? They shouldn't. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days, so to stay with them for a few days. So you see there, it's a command there. And we even see it in the Great Commission. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So even Christians are commanded to baptize believers, right? And we need to baptize them to keep the Great Commission. So keeping the Great Commission is part of, you know, you need to get baptized as well. So it's a command, isn't it? It's not optional. Let's go on to number five. This is a larger section. I know this sermon's going to be a bit longer, so just bear with me. A lot of things to learn. Hopefully uh, this is interesting for you. Number five is, even though it's a command, baptism is a command, that doesn't mean that it's required for salvation. Because remember, salvation is by grace. Salvation is not by works. Baptism is a work. Remember Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. When you get baptized, you're obeying a command of God. That's why if you have to get baptized to get saved, that's work salvation. Right? Baptism is not required for salvation. It does not remove sin. Let's look at some passages here. 1 Peter 3. 
which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water so it's saying they were saved from that water judgment the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us you go oh well, there it is baptism saves us but look he goes on to explain it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh right so baptism doesn't save us by washing us of our sins it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward god by the resurrection of jesus christ so he's saying baptism is the like figure right where into baptism doth most more than our savior it's not actually the washing away of filth it's the fact that you have an answer of a good conscience it's the baptism is reminding us right it's the answer of the fact that you have believed on jesus christ the death burial and the resurrection that's what's actually saving us it's the, which what baptism actually represents is what is saving us okay first corinthians 1 look at what uh, paul says here there's a couple of passages where we can see that baptism cannot be required for salvation paul says here in first corinthians 1 17 look christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words that the cross of christ should be made of none effect now if baptism was required for salvation it'd be quite foolish of paul to say well i'm not sent to baptize because if you need to get baptized to get saved you better be sent to preach the gospel and baptize people but no he says he was not that was not his primary purpose to baptize people his primary purpose was to go and preach the gospel because he didn't baptize everybody that he got saved right because he could have other people baptize them luke 23 we see here this is the thief on the cross he said unto jesus lord remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom jesus said unto him verily i say unto thee today thou shalt be with me in paradise so here is an example of somebody who accepted jesus christ right on his deathbed on his, while he was dying on a cross <coughs> he didn't get baptized <coughs> but yet jesus says today thou shalt be with me in paradise what are some other just logical things that we can think about i mean every believer before john the baptist that was saved was not baptized you know so obviously they they didn't have to get baptized to be saved why do they now in the new testament we need to be baptized to be saved why is it a different way of salvation we're all saved the same way we all walk through the same door um, and again you know jesus was baptized so jesus didn't have sin to wash if the purpose of baptism was to wash away sin jesus would not have to be been baptized so you can see there that the purpose of baptism was not to wash away sin the purpose of baptism was to obey a command right and to associate to do something that god had commanded us to do right now let's just look at a few common verses that people try and use to teach that baptism is required for salvation the, the main one they go to is in john 3 john 3 where nicodemus is talking to jesus and um it's talking about this born of water and of the spirit nicodemus saith unto him how can a man be born when he is old can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born so you remember jesus was saying to nicodemus hey you have to be born again and nicodemus you know couldn't understand or he wasn't wasn't comprehending that the two births that jesus is referring to is a physical birth and then a spiritual birth and this is why he, you can see he's confused here he's like how can a man be born again when he's old does he go back into his mother's womb and then come out a second time and be born physically so you see how he, he's focused on this physical birth jesus saying no jesus answered verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of god so this is where they get this you know ah you see you need to be baptized and be saved but is that what jesus is talking about no he's not talking about being baptized here and then being saved what's the context here it's the two births so he's saying hey it's not two physical births right jesus is correcting him saying no except a man be born of water that's the physical birth and a spiritual birth so the two births are a physical birth and a spiritual birth not two physical births he cannot enter into the kingdom of god and again he iterates here in verse 6 that which is born of the flesh 
this flesh, physical birth, that which is born of the spirit, this spirit, spiritual birth. Right? And the Bible actually has a passage in Job.